It's Paul Joseph Watson back with InfoWars Nightly News. And before I introduce our next guest, I'm just going to read this quote from Glenn Greenwald, the uh, online writer, because it really encapsulates why this issue of uh, mass surveillance really underpins everything else. And this is what he wrote. Quote, this topic is central to all other activism because the surveillance state hovers over any attempts to meaningfully challenge state or corporate power. It doesn't just hover over it. It impedes it and deters it and chills it. That's its intent. It does that by design. And so understanding what the surveillance state is, how it operates, and most importantly, how to challenge it is an absolute prerequisite to any sort of meaningful activism to challenge state and corporate power. And on that note, I'm going to introduce Steve Jolly, who is a major anti-Big Brother crusader there in the UK. Of course, Guardian contributor, uh, Liberty Human Rights Award nominee and spokesman for No CCTV. Steve Jolly, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Paul. Now, just to begin, tell us briefly about how you fell out of love with Big Brother and decided to watch The Watchers. It wasn't something I'd given a great deal of thought to, uh, other than being uh, annoyed by uh, the excessive level of camera surveillance in the UK. You know, you're sitting in restaurants or a bar and you've got cameras watching you. But I didn't really give it that much thought until something happened on my doorstep uh, in my neighbourhood in, uh, in Birmingham, UK, the second biggest city uh, outside of London, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, hundreds of cameras just started appearing from nowhere. Uh, nobody knew what, what they were for or who put them there and we were told at the time that this is just a community safety scheme and that the, the government, the Home Office had provided a grant for communities for you know, enhanced uh, safety and to improve your quality of life, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it really, from the beginning it didn't stack up and uh, these cameras were put in really odd positions in residential neighbourhoods and they seemed to be forming a circle around a couple of districts, a couple of uh, residential communities. And I quickly discovered that the whole thing was, uh, was a lie. It was a surveillance operation, an intelligence gathering exercise. It was funded by three and a half million pounds of counter-terrorism money that uh, ACPO, that's the Association of Chief Police Officers, had requested from the Home Office. And um, they just said, yeah, we need this money to spy on Muslims in Birmingham because they might be Al-Qaeda sleeper cells. That was basically the logic behind it. Um, and there was that suspicion from the beginning uh, we, f we found the evidence, proved that the police had been lying, and uh, basically I went to, the, went to the media, blew the whistle, um, made sure the story kept, uh, kept being exposed in the media. Um, basically, the police were, were battered by a barrage of negative publicity until eventually, after six or eight months, they were forced to scrap the scheme because the cover had been blown. There was massive public uproar. There, uh, these cameras were described in the press as the world's most controversial set of CCTV cameras. And as a result of that, the, the scheme was scrapped, they were completely removed, and it was a massive victory for civil liberties. So that's, that's where it started. I wasn't uh, an activist before that happened, but obviously as a result of that, I, I was uh, researching into you know, the, 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 this surveillance camera issue as well because these cameras were mainly uh, automatic number plate recognition cameras. There were uh, well over a hundred of those. There were some CCTV cameras as well. And shockingly, there were 72 hidden covert cameras forming two, what the police call a ring of steel around two neighborhoods. So you couldn't get in or out without being tracked and all your uh, movements being recorded. Um, I then looked at the, the rest of the cameras and I thought, well, is there, is there anything odd about the other ones that, that most people consider to be normal? And what I discovered was that um, although people believe that they deter crime and catch criminals, they don't. That's an absolute lie. Uh, there's been over 15 years worth of research, uh, academic studies and reports that pretty much all conclude the CCTV has had little or no effect on crime. Um, there's at least 15 reports that I can point you to on our website that say just that. And the Home Office uh, which commissioned many of these reports, uh, uh, along, along with the police. They know this. They know that it's failed to tackle crime. Um, and yet they relentlessly pursue and persist with this policy. So, you know, you have to wonder, if the stated aim isn't being met and the policymakers know this, why do they continue with the policy? Is there another agenda? Uh, and that's when I joined No CCTV as a spokesman and, and I've been campaigning uh, and writing about the issue for the last three years. 
And talking about that other agenda, as he said, we know they don't stop crime. We know it's about tracking our movements for the police state. But as he said, this is also a psychological process. This is about changing our very patterns of thought and behavior. So tell people about this panopticon effect and how it's related to mass surveillance. Well, there's a secondary effect of surveillance. If it doesn't deter crime and catch criminals, then there is a secondary effect, which may actually be the, 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 the primary um, intention. And, and that is uh, the psychology, the psychological effect of mass surveillance. In Britain now, we, we, we're coming to the point where we've almost got a seamless surveillance network. So you can be in a building, you can be inside, outside, you can be on the street, you could be in a bus, train or a taxi, a restaurant, a pub, almost anywhere. Uh, even in a toilet, they're, they're in toilets now. So you know, it's seemingly inescapable and ubiquitous. Uh, and what it, what it does is it, it, it's, a, it's a psychological effect of the belief that you're constantly being watched or that you might be constantly being watched. Even if the, um, even if the surveillance is patchy and sporadic, even if no one's watching, even if it's not even recorded, even if the cameras don't even work, they could be dummy cameras. The psychological effect comes into play then. It's, it's the belief that you are continually being watched. And what that does is it makes, it makes the, the subject into their own overseer. It sort of internalizes, interiorizes that surveillance so that people become their own watcher. And what, the effect of that is to increase conformity and to, um, uh, to, to, to challenge anything outside of the accepted norms. Uh, and it's a really sort of uh, quite a powerful um, automated system of mass control that, that could be achieved by, by this psychological effect. So that's really quite creepy and scary. And moving on to the, to the new level of this, which is obviously we've focused heavily on it here at InfoWars, is this IntelliStreets network, which is being rolled out in major cities in the United States, which is basically a ne networked hub of street lights which are connected via wireless internet, and they double as Homeland Security announcement towers, basically, recording conversations, obviously uh, filming people at the same time, recording how many people go past a certain area. So tell us about the next level of uh, digitized mass surveillance now that it's all going HD, specifically in reference to this IntelliStreets program. I mean, IntelliStreets Intelli is, uh, is, is, is really alarming. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's the Orwellian telescreen, isn't it? It's, the, it's the, 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 the television screen, the camera in the street that can listen to you and talk to you and bark orders and, and, and monitor you. Um, Apparently, these systems can uh, they can count people in the proximity, track people from lamppost to lamppost, uh, listening, talk to you. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's it, it's really quite excessive and extreme. And you have to wonder how much more extreme it could become. Apparently, London has been chosen as the first city to have its own operating system. Uh, this is based on the idea of the smart city, the smart grid. Um, so that everything that's digitized <clears throat> could potentially connect and communicate and talk to everything else. And this is, um, <clears throat> you know, this is, this is just moving into the realms of a vast, sprawling, um, digitized system where all forms of digital data can be connected and um, collated, sifted, analyzed and compiled. And moving on to the, because the, the obvious fear that we normally come across and it is happening is you know, the show us your papers checkpoints, the TSA on the highways, which is all unfolding. But at the same time, we have this more insidious thing, which in the UK is called ANPR, in the US it's called ALPR. Literal invisible checkpoints through license scanning cameras. Tell us about how that started to unfold in the past couple of years. It's already pretty big in the UK. We've got over 10,000 of these uh, AMPR cameras on the motorway network, the major roads, petrol stations. Um, it's a network that's been erected by stealth with no law to allow it, no statutory instrument, no, uh, no permission granted, no public debate or parliamentary debate. It's all done, again, by the Association of Chief Police Officers who write policy over here in the UK. But it's spreading over to the states as well. Um, what it is, is uh, an enormous network that will monitor, log, store, record every vehicle journey. Um, the justification given for it is that it can track stolen vehicles. It can catch people um, through vehicles that are connected to crime in some way. 
And, and what's not to like about that? You know, that's how it's sold. But what they don't tell you is that it's an enormous intelligence gathering tool, um, building reams of data, just, just not, not just about where you've been, but it effectively investigates you in real time for a whole variety of offences. So it'll, it'll, it'll check you against tax, insurance and uh, crime databases, um, but it'll also build intelligence files on where you've been and draw connections between places and people. And um, the, the potential power of it and the potential for mission creep and abuse is sort of built into the system and, it, and it's inevitable. Um, but what they represent is, as you say, it's an automated checkpoint. It's a virtual checkpoint, an invisible checkpoint. You're not going to be stopped by an armed police officer and, and, and told to show your papers. It's done automatically without you noticing. So you just drive past. You don't know this is happening. Um, and what, what, what's happening in the UK is that these cameras are being used to uh, create virtual borders. So we have rings of steel around cities, um, even small towns or communities within a city. We've got virtual borders being created between counties, between uh, over in the states, you know, I imagine that there'll be between counties, between states, around cities. These are virtual borders that, that check you um, simply for driving around. Um, this is an enormous, uh, enormously powerful tool, and the police are, are really interested in data mining that information. Um, it's not just the 2% of data that they currently say they're using, which is um, crime-related data, so vehicles connected to crime, wanted people, stolen cars, that sort of thing. It's the 98% of data that they're really interested in, in now, in, in sifting and analysing that. And basically that's all the innocent people, the people who've done nothing wrong. There's no reason for suspicion, but the suspicion is now automatic. And um, what this could spell, uh, you know, if, if it goes ahead in the state to the extent that it's happening here in the UK, is that, you know, it could spell the end of that great American freedom, that symbol of American freedom, which is the freedom of the open road. If you have a massive network of invisible digital borders and checkpoints, um, then that, that, that's obviously intended to impede the freedom of movement and unchecked freedom of movement. Uh, but this, this relates to the whole sort of digital panopticon, which is that you're free to come and go, or at least apparently so, it appears so, but as long as you're constantly monitored. And um, the, the, this hunger for, for data and compiling data is, is almost an obsession, and it gives, uh, it gives more power than a, than a bad man should have or a good man should want. And that's the problem with it, uh, and it goes across the various forms of surveillance. And I mean, it's you know, who needs the black box? There's all there's again all this fear about putting black box data recorders in cars, you know, for the carbon <coughs> tax by the mile. Who needs it when every petrol station, every car park, you know, every speed camera you go past, this thing recognises your license plate. It it makes the black box redundant, and it it gives a whole new level of control to it. Moving back, though, to the psychological aspect, we had this poster campaign in London a few years ago where it said, basically, you film a surveillance camera, you're a terrorist. They said the neighbours report the suspicious activity prevented a bombing because somebody was filming a surveillance camera. So they're trying to characterise people who are sceptical of being surveilled 24 hours a day as extremists and terrorists. But there's also another side to it, which is a, a PR campaign, which actually is trying to get the public to... Like, like Winston in 1984, love Big Brother. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Well, that's the manufacturing of consent. Um, and it's happened very successfully in the UK uh, to the extent where most people tend to support CCTV. Uh, they, they believe that it, that it prevents crime, that it, that it catches criminals, and that therefore it can only be a good thing. But this is the message that's been sold to us over the last 20 or 30 years. But all the, it's completely contradicted by the evidence. And... Um, Part of you know, the, the, the success of this strategy depends on people really buying into it and supporting it. I mean, there's a lot of, um, a lot of text in the, um, some of the legislation that, that's uh, in the UK that, that, that states that the, what are the main aims of um, the policy you know, to, to do with surveillance cameras is increasing public support for it. So one of the, the key elements to the strategy of introducing surveillance is selling it to the public. And um, this is a relentless process. It goes on uh, every day. You, you hear uh, so many stories in the, in, the, in the media that suggest 
that CCTV is a wonderful thing or that, that, that AMPR cameras will be a wonderful thing uh, to keep you safe and, and catch more bad guys. And I was reading a, a, a copy of um, Jane's Police Product Review, um, which is um, quite a scary catalogue of technological biometrics and police weaponry. And there was an article in there saying that it, the manufacturing of consent and the propaganda has been very successful in the UK, but that, that, that there's more opposition to it, uh, to the to surveillance agenda in the States, and they'll have to work hard to win people over. So they're, they're, they're actually suggesting that they use the same techniques, the same strategy that, that's worked so well in the UK, and they're going to be promoting the idea that this is a, this is a great way to prevent terrorism, uh, and obviously to catch drug dealers or wh whatever sort of demonised uh, criminal you care to choose. Um, and it's the, the, the conditioning, the training of the, uh, the public consciousness to buy into it because it's all supposed to be being carried out with our support, with our consent. Um, they're not openly saying this is something that we're doing to you. They're, they're still sort of pretending that this is something that the people want and we're doing it for you. And it's important that they keep up that, that pretense and that people buy into that. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of effort that goes into persuading the public to support it. And that's, that is a major part of the problem in, the, in that a lot of people do. And also in the US, recently we had the drone industry come out and said they were concerned about public perception about the mass drone surveillance that's now causing uproar and they said that they would need a PR campaign to pacify the public to accept that. So that's definitely an aggressive frontal assault. But really one of the key points is victories because you've had victories. People often think in this surveillance thing that it's just a juggernaut that it's going to keep rolling forever and they can do nothing about it. But there's two specific examples where you've actually had direct victories and rolled back some of this surveillance. So just talk about those briefly. That's right. And it's a really important point, actually, because when you look at the surveillance agenda and the various aspects and elements to it, um, there are loads of tentacles that all seem interconnected. It, it can seem overwhelming and it can give people the impression that they're helpless and powerless and there's not much they can do about it. Um, but there is, there is, but you do have to do something. You can't just sort of wish that somebody else would do something about it. People do have to get involved. But individual projects can be overturned. And e but each individual step needs to be challenged because each step forward is permission to take another step. So it's an incremental pushing forward of the agenda. And the two examples are, you know, I can give a project champion in Birmingham, which was a m massive um, intelligence uh, spying operation. And, uh, you know, three and a half million pounds, uh, it, was, it was probably years in the planning. And uh, because it was the Home Office, the government and the police, people said to me, there's no way that you'll, you'll, you'll get that overturned. You know, there's, there's nothing you can do about that. But I proved them wrong because there was huge uproar, public opposition, loads of media attention. And it was so damaging uh, in terms of PR for the police that they, they basically were forced to remove the whole thing. And a similar thing happened in, in Oxford in, in the UK. Uh, Oxford City Council attempted to mandate the introduction of CCTV cameras in all taxis. Not just CCTV, but listening CCTV. So this was CCTV that would record all your private conversations. And this, this was announced as if it was a good thing and it was perfectly normal. But there was local opposition. The taxi drivers themselves weren't happy about it. They didn't want it. There were loads of local people who, who were just incensed and outraged by it. And we had campaign groups like Big Brother Watch that got involved in advocacy. And um, eventually the, the council just uh, realised that it was, it was a non-starter. So they said, we're, we're not just simply not going to pursue those plans anymore. And that was overturned. And these things can be quashed. But you do have to work. You do have to to to, um, to challenge them. You, it's not good enough just to simply say, "Oh, oh, this is this is dreadful." Um, local people, uh, individuals, not just national campaign groups, um, have to really realise that, that that this this agenda can be challenged. But you do have to challenge each individual step, and it can be done. Now, just here in closing any other key issues with the surveillance state and then go on to plug these two big activist, uh, activist events that are coming up because that's key as it relates to fighting back against Big Brother uh, and also plug the website. But any other key issues you want to throw in here towards the end? Well, drones as you know uh, is a huge issue because what we're seeing there, um, but particularly in America, is the 
importing of the military industrial complex, the military technology used in the Middle East, used in the in war zones, is being imported into the domestic civilian sphere for policing. So we've got uh, you're seeing drones in America uh, equipped with surveillance cameras in, instead of Hellfire missiles, but. but you know, perhaps they could carry both. We don't. We're not. We're not seeing that yet in the UK. But we are. We know that BAE systems are are working with the police in developing drones for surveillance. But they're being very secretive about that. Um, another another issue that's that's really big is internet surveillance. In Britain, we have the the, the, the so-called Snoopers Charter, which is precisely what it is. The Draft Communications Bill, which proposes that every scrap of electronic data should be uh, recorded, monitored and kept because everything you say can and will be taken down and used in evidence against you. And that's what we used to tell people who had been arrested. Now the government is telling it to the entire population, you're all suspects. So that's an enormous worry. And over in the States you have the NSA, which, um, I mean, the vastness of the ambitions of the NSA to, to record every, every scrap of information about everyone uh, is a similar principle. And what we're talking about is, is the introduction of a totalitarian system of government. So, and as you said, it sits over all other forms of activism. And if it chills free speech and inhibits activism and protest, remember, protest isn't a crime. Peaceful protest is a, an essential part of democracy. Um, but it's going to be difficult if you cannot speak to somebody without... Uh, away from the prying eyes of, of the government that you're that you're uh, uh, challenging and protesting about, but you know there there is there is a movement. There are there are people that are doing stuff. <clears throat> it, for instance, in Berlin last year, seven thousand people assembled and protested in the streets of Berlin to, to against Big Brother government surveillance. Now, not one media outlet in Britain mentioned that. Russia Today covered it. And, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's happening, but it, if it's not being reported, it doesn't mean it's not happening. But Freedom Not Fear is happening again this year, 14th to the 17th of September, and it's in Brussels, so they're taking the fight to the EU. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a similar number of people, probably more, and I hope there'll be more reporting of that. Another thing that's happening um, next year, 2013, is... International 1984 Action Day. Now, this is a worldwide uh, series of events. It's going to be an annual event. It, that date was chosen to coincide with the publication of uh, George Orwell's 1984, which is about 63 years ago now. Um, so that's happening next summer. Uh, there are all sorts of groups that are campaigning against this, and individuals too. Um, people that just need to, to, to get involved and do their bit and realise that this is a huge threat, threat to freedom, but there is something they can do, but we do need to challenge it. Um, if people want more information on the CCTV uh, surveillance camera aspects, they can go to no-cctv.org.uk. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of information there. And um, that's it, really. Um, I think the time's up, but... We've got to stand up to Big Brother and fight back. And uh, one of our slogans is now, when will you fight back? Because the time is now. And you're living proof of the fact that one man working with a group of other people can fight back against Big Brother because you did it in Birmingham by helping to scrap that ring of steel surveillance system. So we'll be sure to have you back on InfoWars Nightly News. But for the moment, Steve Jolly, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Again, I urge you to subscribe at prisonplanet.tv. That's where you get all the exclusive media content and it helps support this network. That's going to do it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I've been your host, Paul Joseph Watson. We'll see you on the next edition.